it's uh, Bonnie. Bonnie, uh, do you need people to come up and help you afterwards? So it's in it in the educational building. Okay, so the other building. So if you're interested in helping putting those hygiene kits together, just find just find Bonnie. You'll be okay. You'll be okay. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our salvation. Amen. Let me begin by asking a question. I have all these wonderful youth here, so maybe I should ask it of them. Jay Conover. It's payback time, say. Have you ever done anything crazy? Um, sure. Like what? I don't know. Mr. Cobol. I sure have. You have, huh? Is there anything you would like to fess up to now? No, probably not. Probably not. <laughs> You've never done anything crazy. I know you too well. Anybody else? Gary, have you ever done anything crazy? Gary Long. All the time. Done things crazy. It's a question I want everybody to ask themselves. Have you ever done anything crazy? Like going canoeing on a big lake when you know there's an oncoming storm and you don't have any life jackets and you don't swim very well. Have you ever done anything crazy like that? Have you ever done anything crazy like dare to beat the flashing cameras? on Pasadena Avenue before they take a picture of your license plate as you zoom through the intersection. Have you ever done anything crazy like that? Anybody here got a ticket over there? Raise your hand. We got two in our family. Have you ever done anything crazy like that? Have you done anything crazy like buying Facebook stock on the day of their IPO. Now, I'm not saying that I have done any of these things. But I've done some crazy stuff. And in thinking about that in this text, what I realized is that craziness, and the definition of craziness, is really quite relative. You follow me? Craziness isn't dependent upon what I say is crazy, or you say it's crazy, and yet it is. Craziness is dependent upon the groups, the individuals, the situations. There is no universal blanket that encapsulates this all. For example, if I do something that you think is crazy and it turns out to just work spectacularly, people will say, I'm a genius. And yet if I do the very same thing and it doesn't go so well, then I am ludicrous, ridiculous, abnormal, a loser, insane. I'm crazy. You see, this definition and what we define and say is crazy depends very often on our individual life perspective, where you came from, how you were raised, your personality, the biases, prejudices, thought processes that your parents have instilled in you, and all kinds of other sources. Some people think that jumping out of a perfectly good airplane at 10,000 feet with a little bag on your back is crazy. I happen to be one of those. <laughs> Some people thought when we went to Egypt last summer after the revolution, that was crazy. We did not. Some people think if you take jalapenos and you put them on your taco in very robust numbers, that that is living on the edge. I know in the youth group, when the senior highs meet on, at Tijuana, Flats on Tuesdays for Taco Tuesday, two for one, can't beat it. 
And there is this contest going between who can eat the atomic bomb and who cannot. The ones eating it and the others think they are crazy. Do you see what I'm saying? Craziness is relative to people, groups, each of us. Why, a lot of people these days believe or think that believing in God is crazy. After all, it is unprovable. There's nothing good that can come from it that doesn't come from just living an average, okay kind of life. That you're better off on your own, making your own decisions, having no outside authority or outside beings tell you what may be the difference between right or wrong. There are those who say that Christianity has failed, that it is nuts. But I do not. Because the real problem with the challenge of Christ's message is that we don't know if it would really work. Because before it has ever been implemented in our world, the world has said it's crazy. The world has said it's crazy. It's untenable. It's nuts. Yeah, but thus they've never really given it a try. I mean, what would happen, imagine with me, what would happen if we decided today that we really would live for each other, I would live for you and you would live for me? I mean, what would that world look like if other people's well-being came before my own? What would happen if we said uh, that the priorities Christ named of peace, justice, Equality, graciousness, compassion were truly lived out. And they were lived out not with just people we like or people like us, but people who were very, very different. What would the world look like? What would happen if governments, here's a big one, what would happen if governments who claim to be by the people, of the people, and for the people set aside their own self-interests and agendas long enough to truly act on behalf of all the people, not just their own self-interests. What would that look like? And is it too much to ask? Is it too much to ask, or are you already thinking, he's crazy? It's interesting because when Jesus begins his ministry, according to the Gospel of Luke, if you go to the Gospel of Luke, he is asked to read. And as he reads, he stands up and he opens the scroll to the prophet Isaiah, where he reads from the prophet Isaiah that, that grand text about the Jubilee year. The Jubilee year when all the property reverted to its original owner and God would truly rule. And there's that image in Isaiah of the lion lying peacefully with the lamb. The child being able to play over the hole of the poisonous snake. A vision of spears being turned into pruning hooks and swords into plowshares. And then he dares to stand before that crowd and to say, Today, in your midst, this text is fulfilled. Wow. And how did they respond? They took him out to the edge of the city on a cliff because they wanted to throw him off. He's crazy. That's how the world response. Craziness. There will never be peace or equality in the world. A reasonable person understands that. There's just too much complexity. Excuse after excuse after excuse. Well, then I guess Jesus was very unreasonable and irrational because that was the focus of his life, his ministry, his message, his death. I want you to ponder with me something now. I want you to think about the fact that in the United States, our budget in the United States, we spend $698 billion on defense or the military. 
it takes 17 other nations in this world, developed nations, to equal that amount. 17 others. The United Sp States, in fact, spends on its uh, military almost six times that of the next biggest spender, which is China, and 11 times more than Russia. In fact, the, the budget of the Defense Department in 2010 accounted for 20% of our whole federal budget and 30% of all our tax revenues. We account for 40% of all the spending in the world done on weapons and military goods that is spent. 40%. Now, I'm not saying right or wrong on that. I'm just saying that's the way it is. It's a lot of money, no matter how you slice it. And if you don't believe that is a sacred issue, then just sense right now the tension that people have and the resistance to even raising that fact up. And yet what I want you to do when you say we're number one in spending on defense or military, we are 38th in the world in terms of our gross domestic product. We are 38th on what we spend on education. Now, my question is, what would it be like if those were turned around? Even in a little way, what would it be like? And are you thinking right now, he's crazy? In my adulthood, since I could vote when I turned 18, I have been involved in nine presidential elections. I think nine, maybe more, but I think it was nine. <coughs> and I can't tell you the number of congressional or senatorial elections that I've had the privilege of casting a ballot. But what's interesting is I reflect on that, and as we move into another election year, what's interesting to, to me is that in every one of those candidacies, every candidate, regardless of conservative or liberal or North or South or Republican or Democrat, they all ran on the same theme, change. Change. They're going to change it. It's all going to change. And if they did, then why does the theme work again and again and again? You know, who's buying the bill of goods? And are our priorities right? If our priorities are right, why do we always want something else? What are they focused on? Who are they? Who's determining them? And are they the Christ-like goals that we say matter, or are we really focused on things and stuff and junk? A great preacher of the church once said in responding to the church's greatest critics that it's not that Christianity has been tried and failed, but that Christianity has never been tried at all. I want to close today with a prayer. I want to close today with a prayer that was given to me by our companion guide in Nicaragua a few weeks ago. <coughs> it is a prayer that was read by the Archbishop at Bishop, Bishop Romero's funeral in El Salvador a number of years back. And some of you will remember El Salvador was, uh, or not El Salvador, but uh, Bishop Romero was uh, murdered. He disappeared, right, at the hands of other people as he spoke for peace in that war-torn country. And the prayer is challenging, but it's also inspiring because it encouraged encourages all of us who follow Christ. It encourages us when we have that sense that what we do doesn't matter, that it falls short, that we're losing the battle, that the critics are winning, and that the world is right and we are nuts. We're wasting our time. We're crazy. And this puts it in perspective. It's entitled, A Future Not Our Own. And you guys really need to listen to this. It says, it helps now and then to step back and to take a long view. 
Because the kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, the kingdom of God is beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetimes only a fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is another way of saying that the kingdom always lies just beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives include everything. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water the seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that provides, produces effects far beyond our capabilities. Because we cannot do everything, but there is a sense of liberation in realizing this. Because this enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning. A step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and to do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. And we are workers, not master builders. We are ministers. We are not messiahs. We are prophets of a future that is not our own. This Jesus stuff is nuts. It's crazy. It doesn't make sense. It makes absolutely no sense by most people's standards that you would give up a week, ten days of your time, your own dollars and cents, your family's money to go to another country and help somebody in a situation of poverty like you've never seen. It makes no sense to do that. I have a perfectly fine toilet. Why would I want to use what they have in Nicaragua? It makes no sense. But then you have to ask yourself, it makes no sense by whose standards? <laughs> That's the question. It makes no sense by whose standards? Because the real question here is, by whose standards do you live? The world's or God's? Your next door neighbor or Christ? The words of Scripture or the words on talk radio? By whose craziness are you going to live? And what I say to you, if you're going to be crazy, be crazy for Christ. Amen.